Because here's what just happened. The atheist asked a question that it wasn't a great question, okay? And the Christian went out of his way, took the long way around to look like the biggest jerk on the stage. Congratulations. Is there any awareness of how that comes across? Do you even hear yourself? This is, this is the worst moment of the entire debate. This is the worst moment of any debate that I've ever reacted to. Welcome back to a brand new Debate Teacher Reacts. My name is Nate Sala, and if this is your first time checking me out, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm the president of a Christian organization called Wise Disciple, and here at Wise Disciple, we're all about living effectively as Christians in today's culture. Now, uh, currently, it is Friday. I'm out of town at the moment, uh, but I had a chance to squeeze in this recording, so I jumped on it. Now, normally, we, with these kinds of videos, we vote on these in the community tab, so keep checking that, that community tab, because we're definitely going to vote on the next one, okay? And that's coming up soon. But today's video is one of the most viewed apologetics debates of all time, and so I couldn't resist. And uh, so I think that we should <laughs> sit down and check this one out. It's the epic debate over God's existence, all right? We've got three on three in this one. Three Christians, Jeff Durbin, Saiten Bruggenkate, and Paul Vigiano versus three atheists, Bruce Gleason, Sean Taylor, and Andrew Breeding. Now, this debate took place back in 2015 in Southern California at the Bonson Conference. What was the topic, Nate? I don't know. Uh, I really don't, uh, because I was trying to find it, and it just is not there. It's not stated, okay? It appears it's related to God's existence, but that's all I got. Well, as per usual, I cannot adjudicate the full debate, all right? So this would be like a nine-hour video. So... I encourage you to go back and watch the full thing. I'll leave the link in the description below. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on cross-examination. That's where the rock and roll happens, all right? This is where people can shine or suck really quickly, all right? There are four cross-exams in this debate, all right? So let's jump right in. Let's do Thank it. Thank you, Bruce. Let's do it. Jeff, ready to go? Going? You going first? Timer ready? Yeah, I'll go all first. Right. Uh, Bruce, you're a naturalistic materialist, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you agree with Krauss and Sagan that uh, we're stardust? Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. Pretty much. Well, where do we come from? I don't believe God poofed us into existence. No. no from, as an atheist, you're, from your perspective, would you agree with Krauss and, and, and Sagan when they say human beings are stardust? We evolved naturally from material, yes. Okay. And so there's, uh, it's a godless universe, no governance, no guidance, matter I, in motion. I didn't say governance. Please guidance, try to speak no, into the microphone. No personal oh, governance, no personal governance and order. I could agree with that. Personal, okay. sure. So, yeah. so Durbin is doing what he should do here. He's actually doing two things in debate. First thing is he's pulling from his flow. Okay, so you can see that he's he's looking down at his notes, right? Um, so if you go back and watch the opening statement by Gleason, Gleason's with the kind of longish hair there. Uh, he's the atheist here. You can see on the Christian table, Jeff Durbin particularly taking notes. Okay, that's what we call flow, and you rely on flow. Uh, for your cross-examination. Why? Well, because your job as an interlocutor is to attack what your opponent said in his opening statement, okay? You don't ask any old questions. You focus on the opening. The questions are very important. The words that you use in cross-examination are extremely economic, okay? And Durbin's doing that, all right? The other thing is Durbin is setting a garden path for Gleason, all right? Setting the garden path basically means asking a series of seemingly innocuous questions. Uh, in this case, he's basically just confirming some of the things about Gleason's view that Gleason said in his opening in order to ask a doozy of a question later. All right, so good for Durbin. This is what you're supposed to do, whether you're Christian, atheist, whatever. Let's see what happens. Given that naturalistic materialism, human beings being stardust, what's wrong with eating babies? Because we have a mind, we've evolved to have thoughts. And we care about other people, and we can Bruce. Put what's each wrong, other, morally wrong, with each, eating uh, babies? We can put ourselves in other shoes. That's why we don't kill babies. Okay, ready? We have evolved to accept morality over evolutionary time, Bruce. I'm going to ask you a question here. Over evolutionary time. Two things. One, 
If you think Durbin is being mean by interrupting, he's not. This is exactly what it looks like in a more formal cross-examination style. Uh, your job is to ask pointed questions, you know, to draw out clash. And whenever you sense your opponent not answering questions, you are allowed to interrupt. That's how that goes, okay? This is so the conversation stays on track. The second thing is, Gleason admitted that he's a materialist. Okay, fine. Now, how does materialism account for objective morality? That's what's underneath Durbin's question about eating babies. Uh, he's just asking it in a very shocking manner. And by the way, the atheist is correct. When, when atheists say that we are stardust, what they mean is the origins of our existence can be traced back to stardust. That doesn't mean that that's all that we are. Okay, so Durbin needs to be careful here. I think he should clarify what he means when he starts using certain phrases. You've had two values risen up over evolutionary time. You have stardust that likes to hurt people and inflict harm. And you have stardust over here that wants to do good and treat others well. Why are you arbitrarily choosing one value over the uh, other as stardust? That's a question, Jeff. I'm not, that's an invalid question. It's, it's not an invalid question. There are not two different things going There's on. There's two the values level. risen up, Bruce. There are, there are not two values because at that particular time, no one was around to have values. No, Bruce, today, but, sure, there, there are, are two values risen up. One second. Uh, there are two values risen up. And so the question is, what's wrong with stardust bumping into stardust? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with stardust bumping into stardust. Could you stardust, allow Bruce but... to answer that question real oh, fast? Oh, sure. Uh, well, I, I might actually defer that question, but I don't see stars bumping into stars. What's your question, Jeff? No, stardust. You said human beings are essentially stardust. What's That's morally wrong with stardust? That's an equivocation argument, I think, that you're, you're saying we are stardust a lot more than stardust. Okay, Bruce, you still haven't answered the question. What's the wrong with eating do babies? do have the... The speakers I, I do have the option question, to defer Jeff. to their partners. What's wrong with it is that you you actually support it because you read the Bible. This is this is the insanity of belief that you believe something that it's okay to do because God tells you to do it. Do you believe? So okay, right off the bat, the Christian has connected with the atheist right on the chin. Bam. The atheist is back on his heels and he's stunned, he's spinning out, and he won't answer the question, which means the Christian immediately has the upper hand in this exchange. But look at the other two, okay? Watch, <laughs> let me rewind this. Look at the other two. They're, they're regretting inviting Gleason up with them at this point, <laughs> okay? You got, I think his name is Breeding. He's on the far right. You know, just boring holes into the side of Gleason's face, probably boring holes into uh, Jeff Durbin's head, you know, probably wishing that Gleason would stop talking. Then you got Taylor in the middle there, who is, I don't know if he's smelling his own finger, I don't know what he's doing. He's left his own body at this point, and he's traveled to a tropical island with like 24-7 reggae music, okay? Actually... He's probably praying for the first time. That's probably what he's doing. Both of these guys have to see that Gleason is not doing well here. Killing Bruce, babies. where in the Bible does God say to eat babies? That eat the, babies. The reason I, the reason I don't we think it does. The reason it, it we doesn't. don't to kill babies, yes, in okay. many many verses. All right, go, go ahead. To to skip a, a thousand reasons, there is one very simple reason why okay. we don't eat babies, and it's because we will no longer be. That would be the end of humanity if we all thought it was a good idea. From an atheistic babies. perspective, what's no, wrong no, no, with from, that? From, there is no atheistic perspective. You're assuming value and dignity in these human beings that you say we ought to protect. No, now, no, as a no, Christian, said, real fast, as a I, Christian, I can, I can justify that claim of human value and dignity in uh, babies, but you're assuming it. I'm asking you to provide a justification no, as to why it's wrong to eat babies from an atheistic perspective. Okay. This is not a formal debate. Although it's, it's kind of close, you know? Uh, so in informal debates, which are really what most apologetics debates are, the requirements for cross-examination are pretty loose, okay? You get to make statements. You get to defend your own position sometimes. You can even reiterate some of your talking points. But in a formal cross-examination, you cannot do that. You cannot do what Durbin is doing here. The only thing you can do is ask questions. So I would ding the Christians for this as a judge. Just as I would ding Gleason for not answering Durbin's question here. Right, so three, three things. There is no atheistic perspective. Being an atheist Are you says, an atheist? Yes. There is no atheistic perspective. There's, Are you giving me your perspective? The, I apologize. Every would, single time, my, like the middle of my sentence keeps interrupting the, the beginning Please, of Jeff, yours. Can you but, be considerate and let him answer? This is my time to ask questions. Yes, your time to you answer. You have to uh, uh, give the time to him okay, to okay. Uh, answer the question. Go ahead, please. 
I said nothing about values. I put it so simply as we do not eat babies because we would be no longer. If we and what's wish, wrong with that from an atheistic perspective? That's what I've asked you a second okay. time now. So I'll, I'll answer it this time, yes? Okay. Okay, good. There's no atheistic, atheistic perspective. The fact that I do not believe one's claim that there is a supernatural God of any sort yes. does not guide my morals in any way. So, so your beliefs, your worldview does not... So Durbin, he's not being very precise with his words here, and it's allowing the atheist side to spend some time answering another question. OK, a question that was not asked, essentially, which is, is there an atheistic perspective? And then you hear Taylor saying, well, there is no atheistic perspective. OK, fine. From Taylor's position, he's not wrong. All right. A lot of atheists argue that they have no position, that they begin with the null hypothesis. This is what Gleason said in his opener, um, that what's really going on is atheism is a lack of belief. OK. Christians take issue with this. I take issue with this as well. And I think that those concerns are legitimate. But I would probably not spend any time on this on the debate stage. It's too time consuming. I would simply say, from your perspective as a materialist, how do you account for objective morality? That's the precise question that should be dealt with. When you start saying, well, from the atheist perspective, you know, what's wrong with eating babies? And you're doing that for shock value, really, right? You're doing that to maybe connect with some of the Christians that are in the audience there. You run the risk of getting your interlocutor to correct you on your language. And then also to, uh, to answer the question from a utilitarian perspective in order to kind of avoid the, the moral language, so to speak. You know, oh, oh well, if we if we eat babies, the species will not survive. Guide your living. My worldview, world. yes. The fact that I'm not convinced that any supernatural being exists has nothing to do with it. Okay, we've evolved in a purposeless, cosmic, cosmically purposeless universe, and now here we have babies. And you're suggesting that we should do good to these babies and not violate them and hurt them. Okay? Yes, yes. For, in, in a universe where there is no God, no ultimate standard of justice, I'm asking you to provide me an intelligible answer besides just preference, because I don't want to or we would die, I didn't, I didn't that, provi that provides the preconditions necessary for intelligibility to make that claim mean something. Your claim is that there is no God, no ultimate purpose, meaning governance I in the I did not claim there's no God. You, so you're saying, as, as an atheist, you... Durbin started out so well, and now he's making mistakes. He's making some mistakes here. Be very careful, friends. Those of you who want to get into debate, this is what happens when you lean too far over your skis. When you focus too much on your agenda, that you're actually not listening very closely to your interlocutor. This is what it can look like. All right. Taylor did not say that he believes there is no God. He suggested that he lacks a belief in God. Do not attribute words to your interlocutor that were not spoken. All right. This harms you as a debater. The other thing is, Taylor did not explicitly appeal to his preference in the answer to why atheists don't eat babies. Durbin put it out there as if he did, though. So, again, be very careful to listen to your interlocutor so that you actually clash with what they're actually saying, not with what they're not saying. Do you accept God's existence now? No, I'm not convinced that one exists. That's okay. not a claim that he does so, not. So, in a universe where we used to be fish, why is it wrong to violate a baby? And don't give me, and this is what I'm not looking you're, for. I'm looking for a justification. I'm looking for a justification. A justification that satisfies the preconditions of intelligibility. Not a mere claim. Not what you think we should do. But what provides that justification. Do you want me to justify justification? intelligibility or do you want me to tell you why I don't eat babies? A, ju a justification from an atheistic perspective. Okay. okay. I have a question. He's, he just Go said ahead. there is no atheist perspective. Let me, let me chime in with a question here, if you don't mind. So, I think Durbin started off very well, and now he's just completely run out of gas. I will note, the atheist has not answered the question about objective morality. But you want to know why? Because the Christian didn't ask it clearly. Honestly, I think right now, advantage goes to the atheist side. I had read that, uh, Bruce that you believe that uh, the idea of logic is really coming from the frontal lobe. Is that correct? Yes. And that you don't believe that people have souls, they have brains. Correct. I'm a, not a dualist. A dualist believes in a mind separate than the, than the brain. I believe that our mind is our brain. Right. And you obviously believe in the big, big, some sort of big bang 
That's our best explanation right now, but I'm open to new explanations if something comes along. That's what skeptics do. So in light of that, let me ask you this question. You, you gave us some pretty horrible atrocities for us to consider on this screen. Do you think the people who did those things were wrong in doing those things? It doesn't matter if they think they were wrong or not. They did them justified by religious leaders at the time. I'm asking if you think those things that you showed that were so horrible, do you think they were wrong? Of course. Do you think those people should be held accountable for the wrong things that they do? Sure. Okay, so let me ask you this then. If we're just matter in motion, if we're just molecules... We are not matter in motion. If we're molecules flying through space... We're not if, molecules if flying If we're the end space. result of a Big Bang, because there was nothing, there was a Big Bang, and now we're sitting at the table. How can people be held accountable for their actions any more than a piece of shrapnel can be held accountable for landing where it lands when the explosion goes off? I'm wondering, how do you take that leap from being naturalistic to holding people accountable and stating that they are absolutely wrong say, for the things they do. I'll just say one thing. So that's a better way of asking the question. So the question topic is the same. It really hasn't changed. The Christians have just rewarded it, right? Vigiano stepped in, rewarded the question a little bit. So let's find out what happens. I think that we live in a social contract. We live within a social contract. That's one of my answers. The shrapnel does not make decisions. We do. We realize that we are self-aware the shrapnel is not. That's why we don't look at the shrapnel to abuse it afterwards. We look at the humans that made the decisions and, and fired the shot. Right, but if the, if the mind is and, and just mechanical, if it's just something that is material... Sure, and, and we don't need to I get mean, into... I mean, do you, do you see the, the difficulty... No, because no, no, I don't. Because okay. and, and I think ahead. people would no, see yeah. the difficulty there, but maybe Let's, you don't. Right. And I think it's kind of obvious. Two minutes. Yes. The the reason that we do govern ourselves, that we do live in the social contract, that we to uh, to just avoid all of the obviousness that we are a social species, that we are tribal in nature. We we do come together. We protect each other. We want to live. We have a desire to sustain ourselves. Avoiding, like avoiding, all of, avoiding all of the obvious. Short, if you don't mind, I'd like to get uh, my question in. Avoiding, avoiding all of the obvious along those lines. There are actual rational reasons. We can use empirical data to show that it is a bad idea to run around killing each other. Because if we all think that it's okay to just run around killing each other, okay. we no longer that's exist. That's sufficient. That's sufficient. I have one question for Bruce. Social contract theory and human freedom. Okay. That's basically the answer if you're a materialist. The problem here is... Western social contract theory only works if you first smuggle in certain values, you know, like the value of not doing violence to others unjustifiably, you know, the, 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 the do unto others golden rule and, uh, and the value of the preservation of the species, right? Okay, but here's the question. Why should you begin with those values? What's really wrong with another society who has their own social contract theory that uh, trades on the subjugation of weaker people and weaker nations. And they're doing so because they have their own different values that are smuggled in. See, that's the problem with simply appealing to social contract theory. You don't zoom in on those smuggled in values, which, by the way, are moral. Okay. Also, what's human freedom in a materialist worldview? You know, what does that even mean? No explanation. We'll just quickly say it. That's our answer. It's human freedom and it's social contract theory. So have the atheists answered the question? Yes. Are they great answers? No. I still think at this point, though, the atheists have the upper hand in this exchange. The Christians should have done a, a way better job at listening and asking a lot more better worded questions to draw out clash. In the closing statement of your debate, how do we know what is true? You said, I understand now through the process of looking at psychology on a very amateur level that we could be wrong big time on any of our thoughts, no matter what our personal experiences might be. Do you believe that you could be wrong about any of your thoughts? Of course As I do, said? but I have okay. a confidence level. Okay, that's, that's fine. Then that's fine. That, that is not mentioned in your in, in I have one last question. debates. Could you be wrong about everything you said tonight? Say again? Could you be wrong about everything you said tonight? Logically I do not believe I am wrong. That's not my question. My confident yes or no. level. You see, this is what the problem is, Sai. You deal with absolutes. Right. There, there's a range of confidence that people have. Are you saying there are no absolutes? There is a range of... 
of confident Thank you. absolutes. There is another word game he's playing. I'm going to, do I have any time, Christopher? 30 seconds, please. That? There is a confidence level that he completely ignores. He's going to say, do you know that anything is true? And I'm going to say, well, technically, no. Confidence but I believe is, it's true because I have confidence that it's true. I have confidence that, that Sean's so not going to So you have faith, me. Bruce? Have, Bruce, you have faith? It's confidence. Bruce, it's not you have faith. Do you there's, have, okay. there's Bruce, five Bruce, different the, definitions of Bruce, faith. Can I, can I answer? Time, I, I, I do question. not have faith. If you I, define sorry, faith as a supernatural. I'm sorry, that's time, gentlemen. I'll get that. Time. Uh, just so the audience sorry, understands, man. both sides. Boy, that was a mess. Uh, just a few questions of clarification. Um, is there any experience or set of experiences that could possibly change your mind about the nature of God? Um, any, I say that again. Is there any experience or set of experiences that could possibly change your mind about the nature of God? Sure. If, if God had revealed himself in his word as different than I believe, then I would be diff believe differently. But we believe as Christians that God is the very necessary precondition. Well, going forward, you've already been revealed yeah. those things, right? Yeah. So going forward from that point, uh, wouldn't you have to go in the past to, to make that change you suggested? Yeah, I, I'm not understanding your question. Maybe you could say it again. Okay, so this is an experience that would happen to you now or in the future. So a theoretical experience yes. of, say, if you can explain, I'm, I'm, not, I'm confused about what you're asking. Mm -hmm. So is there any theoretical experience that could change your mind? Sure, if God revealed differently than he already has, I would, I would believe God. In other words, if I had beliefs about God that, that were in fact like? not true, and I had seen in God's word that this is actually what God says, I'd be corrected by that. What would that revelation look like? Well, Scripture. God has spoken but scripture supremely is, in his Scripture son. has been scripted already. Yeah, so God has spoken in... So it would require Hebrews. a new Scripture? Well, Hebrews chapter 1 actually says, in answer to your question... If I go to what God has actually said, Hebrews 1 says that God has in the past spoke to the fathers through the prophets, and these last days has spoken to us through his Son. And so we have the supreme revelation of God in his Son, and we have that revelation recorded for us in Scripture. And so what I go to for certainty is what God has revealed. Again, starting off with the garden path, all right, this time on the atheist side. Not sure where this is going, okay? The question itself is a tad confusing. I don't think Durbin is just being difficult here for no reason. I think the question isn't quite worded the best, but hey, you know what? You're on a stage in front of a bunch of people. The nerves are going. You know what I mean? Let's see where this goes. Well, I'm really glad to hear this um, because this is a really strong point of common ground for us to say that uh, we both are willing to take in new experiences and adjust our world worldview accordingly. And so uh, this... Uh, well, I, this I may just make it stand a correction there. That's, that's not actually what I said. Not just merely take in experiences and adjust our worldview. You have subjective experiences as an atheist that you have to appeal to, and you have brain gas happening, right? And brain gas? Biochem that's, that's, biochemical that's, responses. Is that Mountain Dew tag gas or Dr. No, Pepper bi gas? Biochemical responses are firing in your brain. And so based on those experiences, you live and move in the world. Um, and so when you have experiences, it's based upon personal preference and examination and some, you know, your senses. But as a Christian, we surround an objective revelation. God has spoken, okay, and so that's the standard. I see. Uh, would the two of you uh, concur that... Uh... I think I could maybe help clarify. I think there are peripherals of our faith that we could be wrong, but that does therefore not follow that there are things that we cannot be certain about. And I would say those attributes of God that we can and are certain about are the same ones that you are certain about. Okay, those that God is love, you know, that God I, is good. And so I would say, no, I cannot be wrong about those. Let me, my answer, I, I, I think there's a equivocation on your question. If you're asking um, if my understanding of Scripture is itself canon, I would say, no, my understanding isn't canon. I'm not assigning canonicity to myself. I err in my understanding of Scripture. But I think if what you're asking is, can I be corrected in my understanding of Scripture, um, the answer would be yes. Okay, so your knowledge uh, that comes from the Bible is provisional because it's subject to interpretation. Right. Great. Right. Um, can you clarify real quick, what are your basic assumptions? What are your most basal assumptions for your worldview? I mean, okay, but didn't like Durbin hit on these in his opening statement that God exists, the the attributes of God that that God is the precondition of the laws of logic and and of objective morality and so on and so forth. Like, why ask this question now? 
Um, God is. He is eternal. He is holy. He is unchanging. I gave you a definition in the opening statement. If you're asking once again to clarify... So the Christian God is your basal assumption? It's yeah. uh, that God exists and his word is true. Okay. All right. Uh, so... I would not use the term basal assumption. That's more of an atheistic term. I would say that God has revealed himself certainly <laughs> such that we are certain of his existence. When I hear the word basal, I want to sprinkle it on top of pizza. Anybody else? Just me, huh? Are you saying that your worldview is, uh, is anti-foundational, that you do not have a basal assumption? No, uh, but I'm, the thing is, assumption is, is something that's just arbitrarily done. It's not what the Christian has. We don't just simply assume because it helps us in our life. We're saying that we have a certain foundation by which we can know things to be true. Your position and, is called presuppositionalism. That's you right. must presuppose or assume God right. in order to get to your destination. Yeah, but that's not something that we do autonomously. That's something that God reveals to us. He makes us know. Okay, so that's not, the, that's not the starting point then, it sounds like. Our starting point is God's revelation, his own revelation. It is for you too, by okay, the way. Okay, so it's not the existence of God, it's God's revelation. So it sounds like you're starting with the Bible. Well, we're starting with God's... internal knowledge. Well, I'm saying that even if a person has never seen a man with a Bible, he still has that presupposition of God. Otherwise, you couldn't make sense of the reason. You can make sense of the question you're asking us. Okay, so it sounds Maybe I can like... Help. John Calvin, in his first chapter, The Institute of the Christian Religion, addresses this issue of knowledge of God and knowledge of self. And both of them basically are simultaneously. You can't have knowledge of self without knowledge of God, and you can't have knowledge of God without knowledge of self. So that is the basic makeup of our epistemology. I think that's just a claim. There's no justification behind that. But you could be wrong about everything, it's, Bruce. It's, Don't forget. It's actually, it's actually my answer. So how, could you. How did, how did God reveal himself to you? That's actually irrelevant. Because I don't know how God made a cow, but I know for certain that God made a cow. God well, reveals himself many relevant. ways. Well, Jeff, Jeff well, said, sure, said I'll give you the answer that. God, okay, God has revealed Thanks. himself. Psy 10, Brug and Kate. Psy, you make me want to sigh. It's not irrelevant to ask the question when God's revelation is, as the Christians just got done saying, the basis for their worldview. The atheist is trying to ask about the starting point for the Christian worldview. By the way, I should say, presuppositionalists are a flavor of Christian. Not all Christians would answer the foundation question in this particular way. This is a legitimate question to ask from the atheist side. Himself in conscience. God has revealed himself in revealing his law to his creatures. God has revealed himself in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. So you're just saying everything that you see and experience is no. God revealing himself to you? No, 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 I didn't say that. It was actually God has revealed himself according to Romans 1. He's made himself known to all of us. This, there's a sense of divinitanus. There's a, a sense of the divine and unavoidable, and inescapable sense of God. There is creation itself testifying to us about God. There's mm -hmm. also God himself stepping into creation and walking among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are various ways God has revealed himself uh, to us. And I think one... To, be, to be clear, you, you read Romans, you saw life on this planet, and you therefore knew that God existed. No, there's, there's. I think I, I, I think I laid out a little more than that. There's more just, than I'm trying those. to. Yeah. yeah. I think and to answer same, your question, same, yeah. uh, uh, I think the, the the term that most people in this room would understand mm -hmm. is the term self-evident. Right. That the existence of God is self-evident. This Are might you, be helpful to you. This might be helpful go to ahead. you. If you want to know how I'm certain that God exists, uh -huh. the same way you are. Okay. Well, obviously, I'm I'm not. Well, well, the thing is, when you're in your, your quiet moment, when you have your head on your pillow, you want to know how I'm certain? Think about how you're certain that God exists. I, I know that for this okay. debate, we have to you know, uh, put our position forward. Size, size. I'm, I'm asking that. you questions so that you can give me your perspective. Do me a favor, don't tell me mine, because well, well, that, be, that would not make any sense. I mean, I, I don't need to be fair. here if But, but his if perspective you just wanna... is that he knows your perspective. Yeah. Yes, okay, good. So you know my mind. Can I, can I... I know what God says about your mind. So God told you about my mind. Right. Okay. Yes. Are you certain? Yes. How did he tell you these things? Through his word. What did he say to you? He said that you are without excuse for your suppression of the truth. Uh-huh. And how do you know that I... Because uh, you're basically calling me a liar right now. No, what I'm saying that is you're a I'm truth suppressor. It's truth a culpable suppressor. suppression I, of the truth. Fast, can I, this is important, too. Two when minutes, when we gentlemen. say from God's, from God's word, he tells us all of us... So I don't know... If Sai is being so snarky because this is the general kind of person that he is on a regular basis, or if he's 
doing so to divert the attention away from the atheist's original line of questioning. So the original line of questioning was centered on Durbin's claim in his opener that uh, we know what we know because God has spoken to us. Okay, that's what Durbin said. So good on the atheist for questioning this because they're asking now, how does this work? How does God's revelation work? And I imagine underneath that is, um, how do you know God has spoken to you? Those are legitimate questions to ask. And Psy, <laughs> I don't know if he's trying to troll the atheists in saying, well, I know, and so do you. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know if that's like 4D chess he's playing or if he's really this much of a curmudgeon. Us, not just you guys, all of us before yeah. Christ and reconciliation with God, all of us suppress the truth of God. We construct uh, very uh, sophisticated worldviews and religions to, uh, to, to, to remove God from our mm -hmm. knowledge. It's not just you, but it's a sinful suppression of truth. Right. And, and so that's why, that's why that suppression takes place. We're not saying that you are necessarily constantly aware of it and you're got running it. out of this room here and I you're going, it. ha ha, we got those yes, guys. Yeah. You know, we're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Uh, Being, we're not okay. saying that takes no, no, place. I, I got you. We're, uh, saying, that, we're saying you're self-deceived. last question here. Because sin corrupts our reasoning faculties. Okay, got it. So you, you are aware that there are people around the world and throughout history that believe in other gods and multiple gods and very, very different types of gods. Hold on. Idolatry is popular. And there are people in this world that have no concept of God, that where their language, there is no God in their language. They have zero concept of God. And these same and, people And there are people the like me, which despite what you assert, I do not and have not at any point in my life I've never been a believer in God. Can I've I, can never I, been. Can I respond? I've never. I haven't asked a question. Well, I've never been. I've never been running. convinced. I know it is. Okay. That's why I cut you off. Questions. Yeah, asking now, questions. Now, there are other people just like me that do not believe in God. So, uh, please avoid just asserting that we're all lying or suppressing the question? truth or delusion. Stop question. asserting your world. The, okay. Can I? The, can I? Can I respond? The question. The question is, okay. how do you know? How was it revealed to you? with certainty, with absolute certainty, that the Christian God does exist. Because apart from God, you couldn't frame the question. That's, because gonna, he's I'm a gonna, necessary gonna, precondition for all that you're assuming. Jeff, you said, one, one you thing, said in, your, in your opening statement. You ran statement. for a minute asking a question, yeah, if I could have a few volume. seconds to answer. You're evidencing dependence upon him right now because though you claim to be an atheist, you assume things that do not comport with atheism. For instance, you're here arguing about absolute laws of logic and contradictions. You're trying to get to standards of truth that exist outside of yourself. You're assuming induction this entire time you've been sitting here. You've not thought you're going to float away to the ceiling at any point. You're okay. assuming long, ethical no, uh, absolute okay, Jeff. values. Jeff, in your, opening statement, time, in your opening statement, Jeff, time. you said saying something time. Doesn't, time. doesn't mean it. Absolutely. At this time. Wow. I wonder if Christians look at this debate and they think to themselves, Wow, the Christians are doing a great job. When you are asked a specific question about how your view works, and then you restate your claim that God is the precondition for intelligibility, um, that, that you couldn't actually ask this question to me without God, and then you spend time focused on how your opponent is making a ton of epistemological errors, you have not answered the question. You have answered a different question. OK, you have answered the question, uh, what is your claim about God? You know, what are your claims? What is your observation about the materialist's epistemology? Well, God is the precondition for intelligibility and rationality and the laws of logic and morality and all that. God is the precondition to the question that you're asking right now. OK, but how did you come to that conclusion, Christian? This is where you talk about contingency. This is where you talk about necessity. This is where you talk about the transcendental argument. This is where you talk about the moral argument. You spell it out clearly and simply. You lay the argument out so that everybody can see it. Premise one, premise two, therefore conclusion. What are these arguments? How do they work? But to fall back and restate your claims is to fail at an opportunity to answer the question. For these Christians to go on and on about justification and warrant and, you know, you, that's what you need to do. Don't make the claim. They're not providing their own warrant when they have an opportunity. So on this one, you know, it didn't start off great. This particular cross-exam, uh, the atheist didn't start off well. It was messy. But you know what? I'd still give an advantage to the atheists in large part because they asked an important question and the Christians did not answer the question. Five minutes 
for cross-examination. Two quick questions for Sai. First of all, you said it's absurd to be, pre to be absolutely, uh, to, to present absolute, absolutely, correct? I, I, sorry, I didn't even understand that question. You said that it is absurd to present absolutes absolutely. No, it's, it's absurd to deny them. Absolutely. That's what you said. You said, it's, I wrote it down. It is absurd to present absolutes absolutely. Well, I believe exactly that, what you said. I believe that if I did, I misspoke what I meant. That's interesting. Let's see if I can go back. Let me rewind this and see if I can find it. Hold on one second. He doesn't want to go down that road because it is absurd to reject absolutes absolutely. There it is. It is absurd to reject absolutes absolutely. Two quick questions for Sai. First of all, you said it's absurd to be, pre to be absolutely, uh, to, to present absolute, absolutely, correct? I, I, sorry, I didn't even understand that question. You said that it is absurd to present absolutes absolutely. No, it's, it's absurd to deny them. Yeah, that's right. That's what Sai said. That's what you said. You said it's, I wrote it down. It is absurd to present absolutes absolutely. Well, I believe exactly that what you said. I believe that if I did, I misspoke. What I meant to say was it's absurd to deny absolutes absolutely. I could have misspoken. I don't okay. think I did, but we'll see. Do you, you think I believe in God? No, I don't think you believe in God. I know you do. Okay. <laughs> believe and know are two different things. But Bruggen Kate is a charmer. Okay. The the charisma. It's just oozing off Bruggen Kate. That's correct. I'm going to ask you a question. Short story. I got in an accident on the I-5. I rolled over my truck five times in the middle of nowhere, 2 a.m. I was rolling over. The, the, the roof was collapsing on my head. I knew that I could die. I knew this could be it. Five times. Do you think I would think about God during that time? Don't know. Don't care. You don't know and you don't care. No. Don't know, don't care. <sighs> wow. What a statement. Uh, you don't care that this really happened to this man? You don't care to hear what was going on in his mind right before he thought he was going to die? I mean, is this a great question to ask an opponent in cross-examination? No. But it's, it's Gleason's time to ask the question. If he wants to explore this and he's being open and sharing something, why would you say, I don't care? Where is Christ in that little comment of yours? See, it's, it's, it's people like that that give, that give folks a sour taste in their mouth for Christians. He doesn't care. Wow. That is very frustrating. That's very frustrating to hear that. Why don't you? It's care? irrelevant to the topic of this debate. I'm asking you this. This is Q and A. This is kind of informal Q and A. Are, okay. If I on. did that, I wouldn't be answering any of your questions because they don't have. No, no. To do with the debate. I, I, I'm telling you my honest answer. I don't know whether you did in an accident five years ago. I care about your soul tonight. Oh, you said you don't care. Right. Now you do care. I don't care about five years ago when you had your accident. I care about you tonight. Tonight, I'm talking to a flesh and blood person creating the image of God, I care about you I, Well, for the record, I did not think of any God at that particular time. Okay, thinking, therefore God does not exist? I was thinking exist? that the people who were, were making my truck, constructing my truck in Detroit somewhere, knew it good. I'm going to... Is it therefore true? Well, you asked the question. I don't know who let Bruggen Kate into this debate. I don't know who let him walk up on stage, but they have to be cringing right now. Because here's what just happened. The atheist asked a question that it wasn't a great question, okay? And the Christian went out of his way, took the long way around to look like the biggest jerk on the stage. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's really hard to do in so little of a time. And then he says, I don't care about you, but I care about you. <laughs> you know, like, I don't care about you almost dying. I care about you tonight. Does anyone really believe that? After you hear, I don't care, and then you turn around and say, oh, but you know what? I do care about you. I don't care about you then. I care about you tonight. Is there any awareness of how that comes across? Do you even hear yourself? This is, this is the worst moment of the entire debate. This is the worst moment of any debate that I've ever reacted to. It was right here. Congratulations, Saiten Bruggenkate. 
Uh, I have a question. Um, so there's a lot on this uh, on this issue of um, the requirements for the for the uh, conditions of uh, intelligibility. But um, there's a few uh, few biblical quotes I'd like to run by you. Uh, Romans 12 verse 2: Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Second Corinthians 10:5: Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Proverbs 3 verse 5: Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. Or sorry, do not lean on your own understanding. Um, aren't these statements a bit self-defeating? We're supposed to utilize our understanding to read these passages that tell us not to utilize our understanding. You, what's the question? No, no, I, I have an answer for you, and then Jeff can answer. My answer, pizza sleeps fast under the west, therefore the much. You're missing the point? Excuse me? You're missing the point? What was wrong with my answer? It, uh, it misses the point, is what is wrong with it. So these are verses. Oh, gosh. I'm really struggling to see anything good happening on the Christian side right now. <laughs> I don't know why anyone, anyone would think that the way that Bruggen Kate is acting is appropriate in a debate, let alone appropriate to just talking to human beings. You know, in his opener, Jeff Durbin said that even atheists are made in the image of God and therefore have value, they have dignity, they have worth. Is that how Bruggen Kate is treating these atheists right now? How do well, you well, can answer. Can I? I, I'm, well, okay, I, you know, the, the thing is, what I did there is I answered very illogically, and he didn't accept it. Why not? Because he appeals to an absolute standard. That's what I was doing, but go ahead, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is, oh, God, this is very frustrating. <sighs> this is very frustrating to watch. <laughs> As, uh, <clears throat> oh, my goodness. If, um, let me just see if I can clarify, because I think you, you're a... <laughs> And maybe it's just um, you haven't studied exegesis or uh, Bible exposition. Possibly. But when I tell my son, and I give my son advice, and he argues with me, I, don't, I want him to use his understanding to understand what I'm saying. So when I say to my son, lean not on your own understanding, but trust me, I'm not telling him to not think. I'm telling him to take the counsel of somebody who knows better than he. Paul's a lot nicer than I am. <laughs> I've noticed. Yeah, that's what I meant. That's my answer. <laughs> I just translated into modern logic. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little confused at this point. Um, there's. Welcome to the club. Yeah, I've had a number of things. One um, minute. But hey, I can't well, be you, certain about Evolved anything. pond um, scum can expect confusion. Yes. Uh, so. I mean, uh, Jeff, again, started off tonight with saying, saying something doesn't justify it. Yes, right. Um, Making a claim doesn't, just just, it doesn't justify it. You have to provide a meaningful warrant. That's right. Um, and there, there's been a lot of discussion about the infinite regress. You know, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? You've got to get down to a, a foundation. Everyone has presuppositions, assumptions, whichever you, way you want to call it, at the bottom of their epistemology. Their, their worldview, how they, how they think and, and come to knowledge. I haven't seen the justification, though. I, I've, I've heard insults and, and assertions that, that we are just suppressing God. We know it. You know, everyone knows it, which would work well for your position, except for I really don't, and I'm really not. Okay? I'm very open to it. You don't mind I'm that not, we trust please, God's word please. over yours? It's unbelievable. The middle of my sentences continue to interrupt the beginning of yours. Well, here's the thing. Is that absolutely wrong? <laughs> well, can I say it's time, one thing to be helpful is if instead of instead it's time, of gentlemen. comments for time, a gentlemen. I believe it's Sean Taylor. At this time, you have 15 minutes for. Uh... No, actually, yeah. you know, the, it's been brought up a couple of times. All the other religions, and of course, this is not an, a debate between various religions. It's a debate between atheists and 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 Christians, the triune God. But having said that, there seems to be this opinion among atheists that they just believe in one less God than what we believe in. And it sounds clever, but let me ask you a question. Do you, um, do you think that it's possible for a math question, a difficult math question, 
to have many wrong answers when people try to calculate. Is that possible? Many wrong answers? Yes. 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 Um, would it be reasonable then to say that basically when you're talking about math, there's one right answer? Yes. Most of the time. Right. Just basic math. We're not talking about common core. <laughs> well, I got four semesters of calculus, so... By the way, Bruce, you look way better without your beard. I, I like that. Less evil. I love the beard. You should have kept uh, it. Uh, 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 beards are... You got a contradiction are, right there. I'm going to argue that. Yeah. Um, going back to my math question, does it follow then reasonably, since there are many wrong answers, one right answer, that, that there is possibly no right answer to a math question? Well, that's a great question. Sorry. Well, that's a great question. Um, so the, the, my first point I would like to make is that uh, the debate tonight is also about the attributes of God, which if in question, open up all possible gods. So they are all on the table right now in the view of um, soft atheism. So to answer your, the next part of your question, um, it's, a, it's a bad analogy because mathematics represent an internal truth within itself because you assume certain axioms and then you work through certain truths from that. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily tell us things about the world. Right, but wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that either there is a God or there is no God or that there are many false gods? I mean, isn't that what we're talking about? There's, there's either no God, one God, or many gods. Right. Yes. So it doesn't, it doesn't follow then that because there are many gods that it makes more sense that there be no God. It does follow that because they all are in contradiction with each other. No. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, quick question, just, just to kind of work through these. I'll do my best to go quickly and just answer quickly if we Thank could. You. Uh, uh, you said that we use Pascal's wager. When? When did I say it or when did you no, use when it? No, did when did we use that argument? We, we actually hate that argument. I think yeah. it's terrible. Oh, okay, so, good. Uh, I, it was my impression that you used it when appealing to... Okay, so we didn't, in fact, save, make that Saving point. other people from hell... Okay, and that is, an encourage, that is an encouraging way to influence people. Yeah, but that's not Pascal's wager, though. That's, not, in fact, not Pascal's wager. Okay, you made the claim it may just be logic just exists. Correct? Oh, yes. So if we were to say from the Christian perspective, God just exists, would you accept that as an atheist? I wouldn't accept it, no. Yes. But uh, to say okay, that... Okay, you, you asked the uh, next question. We've got to go fast here, my friend. Uh, you said logic may not be absolute. Is it true? It's possible, yes. So it's not possible? No, it's possible. So it is not possible? Possibility is not rendered by absolutism. So possibility is rendered by absolutism? Possibility is not rendered by absolutism. It is. No, it, because, just because you have contradictions... Uh, does, does not mean that you have to abide so by... So you don't actually believe your claim. Um, no, I do believe my claim. I've, I actually, and I gave, I gave you, you, uh, you plenty of, I've gave you plenty of evidence why that claim is you, perfectly You mentioned, feasible. Um, quickly, that laws of logic may, are just conventional? Yes. Okay, so if society determines different laws of logic where you can contradict yourself, that would be appropriate for you? I'm sorry, say again? If a society determines by convention that you, it's perfectly okay and acceptable to contradict yourself, would you accept that? Uh, if logic is a convention, that's entirely possible, yes. So it's possible for society to say uh, illogical things and contradictions, and that's acceptable by convention. It's, it would be relative to the community defining what the logical convention is. So logic can... So this is going really well, all right, for the Christian. Like, honestly... Where was this line of questioning three cross exams ago? You know what I mean? I mean, like, this is what all cross exams should have looked like from both sides. Okay, boom, here's my question. Boom, here's my next question. By the way, uh, that last question there is designed to uh, be a reductio ad absurdum, right? Durbin wanted his interlocutor to say something that sounded absurd to the ear that is a consequence of the view that he just espoused, and he got him to do it. Okay, congratulations. This is going pretty well. Can change over time. Logic can change, yes, over time. And Thank you. So you mentioned that these couple guys came along recently and came up with the 
uh, transcendental or presuppositional school of thought. Can I ask you if you know when the book of Proverbs was written? Okay. Uh, 2,000 years ago? Can I, I have okay. one question because we're almost out of time if you don't mind, Jeff? Yeah. Can uh -oh. I ask just one question? No. What evidence would it take to convince you of the God who says you already have enough evidence? I got one. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. Two minutes. If uh, we woke up tomorrow and there were two moons, and the moon was revolving like tidally locked uh, moon that we have now, and it started revolving, and on the other side it said, God in Hebrew. I think you misunderstood the question, but I, I, what I would, imagine it, that What the, would convince me that a God exists? No, no. Which evidence would convince you of the God who says you already have enough evidence? What evidence could convince you of that God? Logically, it's impossible. I'm sorry, That's I don't the understand point. the question. Enough evidence? That's fine. That's fine. Unless we have time. What evidence could convince you of the God who says yeah, you do already it again. have enough evidence? I, I Ask it again. What, what evidence would uh, convince you of the dragon God. that already told you that he... Who decides to let Bruggenkate speak at this point? I, I don't understand. The question is convoluted. That's... That, <laughs> it's a, it, this is a question designed to rally the base. All right, Christians are supposed to smile at that question from the audience and kind of nod... It, you know, and some kind of uh, inside joke that they all understand that nobody else understands. And that's it. Like, what a waste of time. Is yes. that your world? You're, just a, you're, you're smuggling in this assertion that God has already given us evidence. Right. Which, and I, I, have not, I have not had a revelation from God. Can, you, can I? So, this has come up a lot. And if okay. we're allowed to just continue at least for another 10 seconds, this has come up a lot. And I just oh. want to make sure I respectfully say to you, because it seems unfair just to say, yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. The point is, is that, is that you're evidencing dependence upon your creator because though you profess we that he does not exist, creator, you are appealing to uniformity, laws of logic, you ethical absolutes, as well. and we're saying it's a violation of your own professed view of mm -hmm. the world, so you are evidencing dependence upon him. Yes, yes. But you didn't justify that. Saying something doesn't justify but you're it. doing it right now no no you're you're, you're just assuming saying uniformity you're, you're assuming you're just, laws of logic abs that. ethical absolutes this does not prove god or are you ready it am i allowed not. to choke you to win the debate tonight <laughs> uh yes you would you would be winning morally the debate but I, more, am i morally I allowed is that how you win you, debates real, real quick yes or are no we talking... do you win debates by force okay how how often and how far do you want to keep shifting the goalposts here we were, just, we were talking about one thing, the question, you just If you could just morality. answer the question, it'd be great. Can no. you, can, is it appropriate? No, it's not appropriate. Time, it's not appropriate. gentlemen. So that violates your own position. At this time, Sean... I, this is... I've seen enough. I've seen enough. This was very disappointing, okay? From both sides of the debate, really. And I'm surprised because I've seen Jeff Durbin debate in other venues. Uh, I did another video with him and I think it was James White. And Jeff Durbin slayed in that video. Like, he made little to no mistakes, if I remember this right, as debater. It was almost perfect, what he did, um, in that particular video. Here? Boy. I don't know. Maybe he was influenced by who was sitting next to him. Or, I don't know, but it was a huge mess. First cross started out pretty solid from the Christian side. The atheist side was not answering the question. But then that kind of shifted midway through, and the atheists started really pressing in on language and definitions, and they actually revealed some sloppy mistakes from the Christian side. And then from there, the atheists really had the advantage throughout, um, until that last part, the last cross exam where Durbin got in some excellent questions, boom, 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 uh, rapid fire, one right after another. But unfortunately, it was not enough, in my opinion to overcome the fact that the atheists won this debate. That last little parting comment there that Sean Taylor made was correct. The, the Christians did not justify their position. Sean Taylor, by the way, was the strongest atheist at the table, all right, in my opinion. Jeff Durbin was the strongest Christian debater on the Christian side. A part of me kind of wishes that these two would have just been the only ones up there and they would have just gone at it the entire time. That probably would have been a way better debate all the way around. Well, those are my thoughts. What did you think? Do you think the Christians or the atheists won? Let me know in the comments below. I hope that this exercise, as frustrating as it was for me, was valuable to you and that it gets you thinking about how to better communicate in these kinds of discussions. Uh, that's all the time that I have for this one. Thanks very much for watching. I'm going to take a break right now, uh, but return soon with more videos in the near future. And in the meantime, I'll say bye for now.